I did want to reiterate that we will be muting everyone, uh, but uh, we will have the chat feature up and running. So if you have a question that you uh, wanted to ask Gay, feel free to just throw it in the chat and I'll be monitoring that. So that at the end, um, I'll go ahead and Gay and I will kind of have a, a little conversation uh, based on her talk and some of the questions that y'all have put in the chat. So please throw those in there and uh, we'll make sure that we have a you know, lively conversation about Gay's work. I know she has been working on this talk and it's going to span her career. So I personally am very excited uh, for this. And we are recording this talk, so it will be available afterwards. Um, we'll post it, I, I assume, on um, a &H outlets and then the Comer Collection website will have that available as well. But we will uh, get more information out there for you regarding recordings, if uh, you, any students who weren't able to make it tonight, uh, any members of the faculty or the community would like to watch it, um, we'll make that uh, available for everyone with, with Gay's blessing. So we're super uh, thankful for that. Um, I wanted to also, I wanted to introduce uh, our graduate student curator, uh, Jessica. And, and I'm so, I, I love her so much and I'm so glad that she uh, was, was here this year to wait for a year to have this exhibition finally come to fruition. She worked so hard on it all last year and then, or I guess the year before, and then when 2020 just kind of canceled everything, uh, I was so glad that Jessica and, and even Gay was willing to stick around and, and come and be with us tonight uh, almost a year later than we had originally anticipated. Um, but Jessica is, uh, was our research assistant last year and um, she is incredibly talented. And I know that without her, uh, it's, it's been uh, a challenge for me to stay organized. So um, I'm super you know, excited for what she has to bring uh, tonight for us to, um, to experience and, uh, you know, wanting to bring Gay in and, and talk about her work. The uh, Comer exhibition, Crafting Cultural Hybridity, which is what Gay's work is uh, a major part of, will be up. It's up right now in SPIN. It'll be up through April 24th. And um, you can schedule an appointment through uh, Greg Metz or Brian Scott. We have Sign Up Genius um, available for that. We can go see the physical exhibition. It's lovely. Um, but tonight we, we have the pleasure of hearing from Gay Block and I'm gonna introduce Jessica so that Jessica, Jessica can then introduce Gay. Um, so Jessica is a, a curator, a writer, an art entrepreneur focusing on Texas art. She's worked nearly 15 years in various arenas throughout the Texas art scene, including major museums, galleries, and private collections. As such, she has a keen understanding of Texas art institutions and their collections and can draw upon a strong network of art professionals throughout the state. Jessica also has a background in registration and art advising, services which she renders through her business, Engel Art Consultancy, LLC. She has established archival policies and procedures for multiple public and private collections, Comer collection included, and is fluent in art acquisition, preparation, and the art market. As the founder of Texas Vignette, an organization dedicated to promoting, supporting, and connecting women in the Texas art scene, Jessica has experienced building a successful nonprofit. In her capacity as president of Texas Vignette, Jessica has acted as a liaison between the board and the advisory council and has helped raise over $120,000 in monetary and in-kind donations for various initiatives, including artist grants and an annual art fair. Jessica is currently a PhD student at UT Dallas, specializing in modern and contemporary American art with a particular emphasis on Texas art, photography, and feminism. She has presented art at, presented at major institutions such as the Dallas Museum of Art and the Fourth Museum of Modern Art, and has curated exhibitions in institutional, university, corporate, and gallery spaces. She's currently working on a dissertation that surveys female Texas photographers with the goal of publishing her research as part of a four book series. Welcome, please. I will now turn it over to Jessica Britt-Ingle. 
Thank you so much, Diane, for that lovely introduction. I feel <laughs> sad that I'm no longer a research assistant for the collection and that I won't get to see your lovely face more often. But um, I was the research assist assistant, excuse me, for uh, three plus years. So it's been a while that I've been living with this collection. Um, so I'm thrilled this is happening now. Um, when I first began researching this exhibition with plans to explore ideas of photographs that can be simultaneously objective and sympathetic, I immediately thought of the work of Gay Block. Um, and lucky for all of us, she agreed to be the Comer Collection's honored photographer for 2020. And as you know, the exhibition and her subsequent talk were delayed a year um, due to COVID. So I'm thrilled that we're all here now to hear her speak. Um, because she, not just because of her uh, wonderful, brilliant career, but also because she's just a lovely person and I've really enjoyed getting to know her. <laughs> um, so I'll give you a little bit of background on Gay. She was born and raised in Houston, Texas, and her first series, which was taken in the 1970s of members of her affluent Jewish community, relates her upbringing there. Her series Bertha Alice gives an unflinching and intimate portrayal of her family with a particular emphasis on her mother and Gay's relationship with her. Her best known work is that of the Rescuer series uh, created in the late 1980s with writer Malka Drucker and containing portraits of men and women who risked their lives to aid Jews in their escape from Nazis during the Holocaust. This series was exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art in 1992 and culminated in a book containing 105 portraits and interviews. She has a number of books that uh, published that have published her collection and, or her works. I'm sorry, her work and her work is collected by the Museum of Modern Art, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston and the New Mexico Museum of Art, just to name a very few. <laughs> Today, Gay will survey her nearly 50 year career as a photographer, most of which is explored in her monograph about love for which this talk is titled. Her images are intimate, compassionate, and simultaneously objective, allowing viewers and the photographer herself to easily connect with her subjects. Block explains the title as such. Through photography, I have learned about love. I hadn't learned about it at home or in school, I couldn't have learned about love without photography and I'm still learning. I think that is just such a beautiful quote and, and such a great entry into her work. So I'd like all of you to please join me for a virtual welcome of Gay Block. Thank you very much. I don't, am I on screen? I mean, on. can you hear me? Yes, all right. Um, well, I wanna thank you very much, Diane, um, as the correct collect director of the Comer Collection and Jessica as a curator of this exhibit. And of course to Jerry Comer for in, in acquiring my work for the collection and making it possible to be here tonight. First, I want to give you a heads up so that, uh, that, there, that there are several nudes in the very beginning of my talk, and that will be all of them. Um, I've been asked to speak about my photographic work tonight with an emphasis on rescuers. So I'll be a little bit briefer in talking about my other work. I still hope to give you a good overview of my photography. When I began making portraits, I asked people about their lives and their values, especially, and for hints about what got them through dark nights. Sometimes I felt that I asked questions I couldn't have answered myself. Photography led me to discoveries beyond what I knew possible. It formed and shaped me. I couldn't have learned about, about love without photography, and I'm still learning. Um, I think we have to start, yes. So that's why the book is called About Love. Oh, wait a minute, we're, we're trying to figure out why this is a, the, yeah, the image is not advancing. I think it did advance. I don't need that. Okay. There we go. <clears throat> Earth Alice, my first, I got my first camera, a Kodak Brownie camera when I was 12. I was very excited because I loved taking pictures even then. I focused on my family and I used it to document aspects of our, our lives, especially that of my mother. You can see some of those Brownie prints right here. And I didn't realize at the time that this was what I was doing. 
So when I enrolled in my first photography course in 1973, my, my teacher said, put film in your camera and start shooting something you need to understand. And I immediately, of course, thought about my mother. The next morning, I went to her apartment, letting myself in with my key. When I entered her bedroom, she was on the phone, nude, which was not unusual for my mother. I wasn't surprised and she didn't flinch. I waited a few minutes and then I took a picture and again, she didn't flinch. When I was off the phone, she tried to show me some business papers, but I wasn't interested in them. Uh, but I took another picture and then she started posing and the last three poses here amused her. I was surprised I had done such a thing. I developed the film and made some prints, but never took them to class. I showed them to mother and we had a good laugh. I don't recall her asking me to be discreet with them, but I think she trusted that I would. I actually hid the negatives. Five precious frames. It wasn't until 23 years later when she had been dead for five years that I decided to see if these negatives would actually print. I wasn't sure. I had taken them before I knew anything about photography. But they did make very fine 2024 prints. <laughs> I continue to photograph and videotape conversations with mother, always trying to understand her, to like her really, to see if I could get her to love me. Mother was the fulcrum of my work for the first decades, two decades, whether or not she was actually the one in front of my camera. After she died in 1991, um, <clears throat> working for 10 more years on a book about her, I began to understand her and to realize that we had actually loved each other. This work helped me to redeem and honor my mother. From the beginning, I wanted to make portraits of, this, of the people in my community, the affluent friends my parents, of my parents who, in whose midst I had grown up. I felt critical of their values and I wanted to expose them in a way. I began making appointments to photograph and record interviews, and much to my surprise, I discovered that their lives were honest responses to the circumstances they lived through. Many had memories, or at least had heard of their parents' memories, of a time and place when Houston's Jews had few opportunities for upward mobility of any kind. They were excluded from some neighborhoods and country clubs and law firms but they managed to become successful and create their own communities and businesses. This is the Lewis family who had a, a grocery store chain. I used a large format for four by five camera for most of these early portraits. As a reformed Jew, my religion wasn't as obvious as strangers, uh, to strangers as more traditional Orthodox Jews who dressed and looked different. Even so, the truth was that as one person told me, you weren't exactly you weren't exactly ashamed of being Jewish, but you were quiet about it. You wouldn't whisper the word, you would whisper the word if you were at a restaurant. That's what Houston was like until the 80s. This is a mother and sons. And as you can see, they seem to be in the same position, which I did not ask them to do. I didn't do any directing. But when they took that pos position, I turned off my um, audio and said, please don't move and took the picture using a four by five camera at that time. I think I said that. This is a mother daughter. And again, they took these positions and they wore these clothes without my direction in any way. Um, okay, the next, and this is um, mother and daughters. And um, it was not, in, not one of the living room portraits that I was accustomed to making, but it was at a meeting and I saw the mother and daughters like this and I wanted to take their picture. And I identified the mother with, she kind of looked like my mother would have looked as well as the one on the right. But for me, I identified it with the one on the left because I was an overweight person. And that's what I, that, that's the one of these three that I identified with. I was coming to understand from these people's words and I was learning about a shift in my own perspective from looking at the photographs I was making. I had gone into their homes with some intolerance of their values. 
and came out with a portrait of someone I understood and even liked. And even before I knew the shift was taking place, I could see it in my portraits and it hooked me on photography forever. And you just saw a couple of pictures of children and I loved going into children's rooms uh, where they were the most comfortable to photograph them. I know this uh, little girl looks like a boy and so many people think it is, um, but it's a 12 year old girl. Okay, the next. Um, these are, these are images I continue to make um, in people's living rooms. And then I got tired of making um, appointments. And so I went to the Jewish Community Center swimming pool. And, and I went on weekends when it was the most crowded. These people were Houston Jews I really didn't know. I was from the country club set. None of my friends or parents or even my own children ever went to the JCC pool. But of course I loved being there because I loved what I was learning about these people. I probably belonged there more than I belonged at the country club. I began taking portraits with a medium format camera there, which allowed me more spontaneity. They sat in chairs around the pool in specific places, the teenagers in one section and the old Russian emigres in another with children and grandchildren in another. There were married couples without kids, but the biggest group was the families who brought picnics and, and drinks to share. At the country club where I grew up, the parents did not hang out with the kids. Instead, they played cards or golfed after they dropped, their, us, dropped us kids, I would say, at the pool, but here, parents were with their kids. The experience of photographing these families gave me a new perspective on family togetherness. One day I noticed an overweight woman in the pool holding hands with her husband. I asked to take their picture, intuitively pursuing what moved me. When I saw the photograph, I felt as if it were the first time I'd seen evidence of an overweight woman being loved. Having been, or at least having felt overweight all my life, seeing this couple was a great comfort to me. And I kind of started realizing that maybe I was loved in spite of being overweight. This begins with the images that I started making in 1982 on the South Beach in Miami. When, when I went there once with a friend, having never been to Miami Beach, I was just amazed at what they look like. I saw Miami South Beach for the first time in 1982, and I was awed by the beauty of the small deco hotels, but even more so by the sight of these old people sitting on the porches. The first night when I stopped at one of those porches after dinner, it was love at first sight. I knew right away that I would return again and again to talk to these people and to photograph them. These were the Bubbies and Zadies, which is Yiddish for grandmothers and grandfathers that I wished I'd had. I loved best their simple lives, their Yiddish accents, living on their social security checks in one room apartments and small hotels. They walked to their, do their shopping and came back to sit on the porch with their friends. In the afternoon, they took light chairs to the beach where they sat in circles singing old Yiddish songs or they played cards or dominoes or they just visited. I began doing video as well as photographs because I loved the sound of their voices and their accents as much as I loved what they looked like. Whether they were European Holocaust survivors or American born, they all had the accent and decried how their children's Yiddish had been lost. This is Tilly who I photographed two different years, uh, probably maybe a couple of years apart. And um, Obviously, it shows her aging. Um, this was a woman who wanted to show me run upstairs and get her the letter from her grandson that she was so proud of. Um, this woman, uh, whom I call Leopard Lady, told me that she had also been photographed by Mary Ellen Mark. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. I was drawn to return again and again over the next four years until gentrification made South Beach out of reach for these Jewish retirees. 
and so as people ask me if that if he had peed in his pants in that last one but of course that's my shadow and you know, <laughs> since we're not in person i want you all to know that that's my shadow okay <laughs> I loved uh, seeing the people. I loved this uh, area. It just couldn't stand not going back and back and back there. And um, then uh, in 1985, I received a photography commission from Charles Butt, the CEO of HEB. Charles wanted photographs of employees in select stores all over Texas. There were 150 of them then. I think there are probably 300 now then uh, to hang in their new offices that they were building in San Antonio. Instead of making single portraits, I chose to photograph them in the store and then after work, in whatever way they chose, making diptychs of each person. I love talking with the grocery store workers, including um, learning about their life, the life of working people, determining and how they valued both their jobs and their leisure time. There were many Mexican Americans in South Texas, of course, and they greatly impressed me by the way they preserved their heritage through the closeness in their families. The commission was originally for 12 to 18 diptychs, but Charles ultimately bought 40 of them. It was the first time I made any money at photography. Uh, I was just amazed that Charles liked the picture so much. It was just great for me. So this is a group of various portraits I made from 1985 to 2005. On the left is me. And then in the middle, uh, the three of us were close friends, myself, Eve France, and Ann Tucker. Ann Tucker may be someone you all have known about because uh, she was a fairly illustrious uh, curator of photography at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston before she retired a couple of years ago. Um, on the right is a uh, doorman. Oh, it's okay. On the right is a doorman at the um, at, at a New York uh, apartment house. And then again, uh, this is Paul Manette, who was a good friend of mine in Los Angeles. His lover is behind him. And at this time, he was dying of AIDS. Um, instead of making single portraits to photograph these people in the stores, um, I went back to, um, okay. This is a group of various portraits made from 85, okay. Um, well, I'm sorry, I just lost my place. Um, okay. There, and this is a portrait of, of a waitress in Roseburg, Oregon, and one of a bank president in Jerome, Idaho. Uh, because my father had been a chairman of a board of the of a bank, I felt comfortable to, asking to meet the walking into a bank in this small town and asking to meet the, the chairman. Um, a lot of people wouldn't have felt comfortable with that, and it was funny to me. Um, these are, this, there are some uh, images here from New Mexico. This is a mother-daughter, Laura and Anita. And then uh, uh, one day going to coming from uh, on my way home, I saw this girl leaning against a car just like this at what's called the Tosuki Village Market, which was just around the corner from my house. I ran home, got my camera, came back, and she was the, the family was still there. And I said to her, I asked their permission to take a picture of her. And I said to her, when I first saw you, you were leaning against the car. Would you please lean against the car for me again? And she took exactly the same position I had seen her in, in the very beginning. Um, let me see, I've lost my place on my... Uh, <laughs> there are also several portraits from my series out in Santa Fe. This one is called We've Been Together 38 Years, Portraits of a Lesbian Couple and a, a Musician and a Visual Artist. In writing this descriptive piece, I can feel all the love I felt when I took these pictures. Love of these people, love of photography, and now a little melancholy about the past. I'm grateful to have these photographs that put me back to these moments with those people. Yeah, that's a really amazing thing. When in the 50s, I went to a summer camp for eight weeks uh, every um, 
every summer for five years. And in 1981, I returned to the summer camp that I had first attended um, to visit my daughter, who during her last of seven summers at this camp, I was curious to see what the girls were like. So I got permission both from my daughter, Allison, and from the camp director to stay for about a week and photograph the campers. Who are these girls? What did they talk about? Had it been a mistake to send Allison to a camp of privileged girls for eight weeks? What values had she learned there? As I looked at the girls through my lens, however, none of these questions entered my mind. Instead, I became fascinated with what they looked like. I loved the innocence and promise in their faces, seeing in them what I imagined as their future selves, the wives and mothers they would become. Or would they? I had a new set of unspoken questions because my own life had changed so dramatically these, these, these three years earlier. I had left my marriage and begun my life as a lesbian. As I looked into these girls' eyes, I wondered about their future choices, but I never asked anything. All I wanted to do was make their pictures. 25 years later, with Allison's help in finding 65 campers from the original photographs, I photographed these women again, this time filming and interviewing them as well. I asked them to describe their camp experiences and tell them about, tell me about their lives today. They were generous with their time, but it was the hardest photography I'd ever done. These young women really cared about what they looked like and they wanted their portraits to look good. It wasn't that I didn't want them to look good, it's just that I wanted to go deeper, to penetrate their facades, to see if there was an inkling of what life might be bringing. When the film premiered in 2009 at the New York Jewish Film Festival, and I saw many of them again, I felt a closeness with them, despite being privileged young women. Um, <clears throat> life had already dealt some of them difficult blows, divorce, disappointments, and loss. My own daughter lost a child, my grandson Owen, who drowned in a rafting accident. And this is my daughter and me, and Allison with her older son Julian and Owen. Rescuers, my work with rescuers began in 1986. These were non-Jews who, at the risk of their own lives, tried to save Jews from Nazi extermination during World War II. My friend and author Malka Drucker had been asked by her rabbi to write a book for children about the Christians who had risked their lives to save Jews. And the during the Holocaust, the word used to describe the Nazis' intentional extermination of the world's Jews. For 25 years, Rabbi Schulweis had been talking to the Jewish community about these courageous men and women, but few really listened. Historically, the rescuers should have received at most a paragraph in a book about the Holocaust because in number, they were a raindrop in an ocean of indifference. Yet emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, the rescuers' deeds warrant volumes. Besides saving lives, the rescuers preserved humanity's honor. Perhaps most importantly, they can inspire us today to the highest and best we can be. Still, the Holocaust is a sacred memory. And when we talk about rescue, we must not forget the more than 6 million Jews who perished without ever seeing a rescuer. When I first heard about these people, I wanted to meet and photograph them. I had been to Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Memorial Museum and Archive in Jerusalem, and walked along the Avenue of the Righteous, so-called a path flanked by carob trees, and each marked with a small plaque inscribed with the name and country of a person who had rescued Jews. I assume that these people were um, were dead and that the trees were their memorials. When Malka and I discovered that we could meet some of them, 
Our original idea expanded into a study that took five years and thousands of miles to complete. We ultimately interviewed 105 rescuers from 11 countries. As a portrait photographer, I've always chosen my subjects because of what I might be able to learn from them about human behavior. None taught me as much as rescuers. We began interviewing by, by interviewing this woman as our first interview, Zofia Banyaka. She was a Polish atheist who worked in the resistance in Warsaw. She hid guns in one part of her apartment and Jews in another. And when she was warned of a raid, she moved the Jews to another person's flat. After the war, she worked as a member of Solidarity, longing always for a free Poland, which she had not gotten by 1987, when we met her in Staten Island at the home of one of the people she saved. Sophia smoked like this for three hours, the entire interview. She lit one cigarette from another, and it would have been unthinkable to photograph her in any other way. I love to show people exactly as I see them, so the portraits I make are always straightforward and usually tell which detail about that person attracted me the most. I didn't have to ask her to do this. I just snapped a picture when she did. I saw her as strong and independent. She answered our questions exactly as you'd expect a woman who smoked this way would. Even though she spoke only Polish and the Jewish woman she saved translated for us, we developed a genuine connection. Thankfully, we also made these connections with the next 100 interviews we did of rescuers. We met Joe DeVries in Canada where he and many Dutch, rescue, Dutch had relocated after the war. When he answered the door, the door, he exclaimed, hi, I'm Joe, come in and take off your shoes. We did. Joe proceeded to sit this way the entire two hours of the interview as he told his story. Joe and his wife, Yocha, who was de de deceased by the time we met Joe, saved these two children. Their mother had managed to survive, but soon when she became ill and was dying, Joe and Yocha asked to adopt the children. She feared, however, that they'd lose their Judaism, so insisted that they be sent to Israel to help build that country. Joe and Yocha stayed in touch with them, with the children, exchanging visits for the rest of their lives. And these are the uh, pieces that I made for exhibitions because I didn't feel that the picture of that I made, the portrait, told the whole story. And the story was so important of these brave people. Joe told us that a neighbor who had recently visited him had asked why he saved Jews, because the Jews killed Jesus, you know. Joe said, no, it was the Romans who killed Jesus. But I went to the closet, I took their coats, and I told them to leave and never come back. That was who Joe was. The book is divided by country because the problems of, with rescue were different in every country. Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem, has honored more than 27,000 non-Jews who rescued Jews. More are, more are honored from the Netherlands than many other country because uh, for many reasons. In the Netherlands, you'd be jailed if you were caught hiding a Jew. But in Poland, you were hung in, um, hung in the town square. This says, next picture is of P uh, Reverend P Peter Miedema. Once able to speak six, eight languages, he could speak only a few words after his 1984 stroke. So that when we interviewed him in 1988, his wife, Joyce, translated him. <laughs> she called me after I, this picture was in the book and she said, why did you cut off my head? <laughs> well, I couldn't help it, it made a better picture. I know that's a terrible thing to say, and that was, but it was the truth. <laughs> and so we have to talk about photography too. Um, she said, um, he, Joe said, people said Jews were sly and clever and always got what they wanted. But I told them that they had become that way, had gotten strong from always being so oppressed. 
he was the first one to speak out in his community, which was Friesland in the Netherlands. In a Sunday sermon, he told his people, if you don't open your home and heart to an innocent, innocent fugitive, you have no place in the community of the just. Miedema found homes for children and adults and hid some people in his church, but he lost his pulpit after the war for involving the church in the resistance. That's when he and his wife, disillusioned, moved from the Netherlands to Canada. In Amsterdam, we met Semi Rieker, who said to us, even before my, I accessed my video and my camera, human beings are like, a, like pianos. We have high notes and low notes. I'm not a hero. I'm just lucky that during the war, I got to play my high notes. Semi had lost her beloved husband, who had also helped her save Jews and worked with the resistance. Louisa Steenstra also lost her husband saving Jews. This, this is a, uh, two pictures of Arnold Dallas and Sena Otten. They were from a small village in the Netherlands, New Landa, which was honored as an entire village. One other village was also oh, so honored. You may have heard of Le Chambon in France, where 5,000 Protestants saved 5,000 Jews. Arnold's story, the guy in the red sweater, is that he went every day to Amsterdam where the Nazis had commanded all Jews to live. He told the Jews, come with me. I have a safe, warm house for them. He said, I lied to everyone, but I had to get them out of Amsterdam where the Nazis were rounding them up. He then brought them, brought them to Sena, who lived in Newlanda with his wife and its infant child in a two room house. Because of his family, Sena couldn't was doing what Arnold did. But when Arnold came with Jews he had rescued, Sena took them in and never refused one. And then he placed them in homes of other people in the village so that when Arnold returned with more Jews, he'd have room for them. That's the reason that the entire village was honored by Yad Vashem. And now about photography. These two portraits seem the same, both heads and shoulders. But the two men were so different, I couldn't photograph them together. Arnold, with his burning blue eyes, passionate, was the bandito. I had to photograph him head on. Sena was the quiet one, whose rescue work was no less valuable and intense. I raised my camera above, high, showing his humility. And I want to say that I'm, I did that unconsciously. And when I came back, you know, and was looking at the, my vid videos, I had left the camera on accidentally. And I saw myself raise the camera up high to photograph Sena. <laughs> Marion Pritchard told us that she was quadrilingual at two years old, explaining to us that children can easily learn goodness when they're very young, by example, Marion managed to save over 150 Jews. And once she had to murder a Nazi who was threatening her in her own home. She got the undertaker to bury him under another body the next day, showing us that it took many people to help rescue one person. Now this is the start of the section on France. Mark Donady was a Protestant men, men, minister who said he rescued Jews for two reasons. First, he explained that Jews were the people of the Bible. But second, he said he had felt the same persecution as a Protestant in France, an all Catholic country. So he identified with the Jews. When we interviewed Adele Defarge, I walked around the apartment and found these portraits of her when she was 17. I had to, her hold the framed picture, something I don't usually do and never had done or before or since, but it seemed appropriate. We met Ermine Orsi in Marseille. She was bitter about not having been thanked by the many children she saved never even receiving, she said, a Christmas card from them. One day after the book was published, a religious school teacher of eighth graders 
called me to ask her address because the children in her class wanted to write to her. She'd been reading rescuers to her class and they'd been disturbed when they'd read that Madame Orsi had not been thanked. The grandfather of one of the classmates visited the class and told the children why. He said that even if you were rescued, you couldn't stand thinking about that time when you were totally helpless. So the children decided that they could write to thank her. They did. And Madame replied with deep gratitude. She said, you've changed my heart. That, that story always makes me start to cry. I just love that story that the children, the children in, in seeing her picture did that for her. So I'd like to insert something about photography here. I began this work by shooting both black and white and color. But after 50 interviews, I knew they needed to be in color. I wanted the you who were going to see these pictures later to believe that this was an ordinary person and that each of us can do what they did. That may be an exaggeration because what they did was risk their lives every day. Perhaps we can learn, however, that we can do more than we're doing to help others. Marie Rose Genest drove, rode this bicycle all over her area of France. She lived in Montauban, telling villagers to help Jews. In Belgium, is the, it was the only country in which the Jewish community formed a group to help save Jews. The CDJ, the Committee for the Defense of the Jews, began by placing Jewish children in Christian homes so that the parents could more easily find them places to hide and save themselves. Andre Gulen Herskovici was a school teacher who, who worked in this organization formed and led by Jews to save Jews. She described how painful it was to tell Jewish children on the way to their new homes, your name is not Sarah. It's Susan. You're not Jewish and you never were Jewish. You don't have Jewish parents. These are your parents now. She revealed to us that later, after she'd had children or had children of her own, she might not have been able to do this. In fact, Madame Herskovici continued, after the, after the war, to have dinners and go, uh, she continued to have dinners and go to theater with some of these children, of course, now adults that she had placed. And they cried as they described how painful it was to be torn from their parents, knowing they might never see them again. It was, however, an ingenious operation because more than 50% of Belgium's Jews were survived. <clears throat> this distinguished Belgium from the Netherlands where only 10% of their Jews survived mm -hmm. because although they were geographically very similar countries, because of the CDJ, they were more able to survive. Excuse me, I have to take a sip of water. Although Marie Take had children of her own, more than 80, never had children of her own, more than 80 Jewish boys regard her as the woman to whom they owe their lives. Raised to live a retiring life as a wife of a military officer, Madame Teke found herself, herself as headmistress of the castle of Jamoin, a school for boys whose fathers were in the Belgian military. Half the children were Jews in hiding. And we met her with one of the boys, David Enavlaki, whose life she saved. Poland was a terrible place for Jews. It was awesome to sit with this brilliant professor at Georgetown University, Jan Karski, who had been a Polish diplomat before the war and later became a Polish spy for the underground. In 1943, Warsaw Jews asked him to take the news of, the, of Jews being slaughtered to President Roosevelt and to request money from him 
to be used to bribe guards to release Jews. Roosevelt's response to Karski was, I will win this war, but I have no time or money to help save Jews. Roosevelt gave the underground $12 million, but told him, this is for your underground, your army, not charity to save your children. Karski told us, when you hear people say that Jews were passive and didn't fight, this is nonsense. There were many uprisings and escapes from concentration camps, but the Jews were helpless. They had no identity, no organization, and no place to go, even if they could escape from the camp. Alex and Mayla Roslin were living in Warsaw when uh, Alex noticed that his Jewish customers had disappeared. He, he told his wife, Mayla, I've got to go see where they are. When he came home, he told her, it's awful. I've gone to the Jewish ghetto to see and I uh, saw children dying in front of me. We must do something. She said, what can we do? We're poor and we can't do much. But Alex asked her, can't we save one? And so they took in one child, then another. Mela was very afraid, but the boys survived and went to Israel after the war. We met Agnieszka Budna Wiedershal in Israel, where she had emigrated from Poland. This simple Polish peasant is brilliant. She rescued six Jewish men from the ghetto and hid them for three years. If stopped by a Nazi, she could make up amazing stories to save herself. Antisemitism was still alive after the war. Her recounting to us the death of her daughter after the war was perhaps the most heartbreaking story we ever heard. While still in Poland, schoolgirls asked her to walk home with them, and then they pushed her under an oncoming train. That was when Agnieszka and her husband decided to emigrate to Israel. We visited Irene Updike in California, where she loved to talk to school children. She said, I told them, I saw it. She tells them about the danger of hate and the courage of a few. During the war, she worked as a maid in the home of a German major and unbelievably hid 12 Jewish people there. In Germany, you were not only risking your life to save Jews, but you were deemed a traitor as well. In the rescuer's book, each rescuer's story begins with an introduction written by Malka, and I'd like to read you parts of this one for, the, for Maria Countess von Maltzahn. The taxi driver asks us to check our address in West Berlin. This is not a good at neighborhood, he explains. But the Countess, born into enormous wealth, lives in this primarily Turkish slum, as she calls it, with pride and conviction. Here, she's still a friend of the weak and powerless. She's still rescuing at 80 years old. Her mind travels from one global problem to another. Anger and toughness are balanced by compassion and empathy, empathy for others. I hope this shows in her portrait. Uh-oh. Oh, I lost a 17. Okay. Um, what's her name? <laughs> So yeah, Helene Jacobs, um, we met in her Berlin apartment. She spent 20 months in prison for her underground work. In an award acceptance speech, she recalled 1933 to 1945, my grief remains predominant, that we did not stop it, that we destroyed ourselves. When a community destroys part of itself on purpose, out of hatred, it degenerates. That's what happened to Germany, she told us. Gertrude Luckner began as early as 1923, warning Jews to hide to save themselves. She traveled all over Germany telling Jews of the danger they were in. When asked if she, think, if she thinks about the war often, she erupts, how can you ask that? 
When you've been in a concentration camp and seen people gassed every morning, how could I not think about it? In 1943, she had been arrested for helping Jews and placed in a concentration camp until the end of the war. Gita Bauer expressed the shame she feels because, because she saved only one. I did not want to accept the Yad Vashem medal. I saved only one, she protested, but the medal reads, whoever saves a single life is as one who saves an entire world. They asked if the woman she saved had children, grandchildren. Yes, she said, she did. After the war, Gita was walking in Berlin and tourists asked her where Anne Frank's house was. She pointed it out to them and then the tourist spat in Gita's face, assuming she had been a Nazi. We met Gustav Nikolai in Germany, but it was Hungary where he rescued Jews. To him, three things were most important, music, women, and Jews. So during the war, he formed a Jewish women's orchestra and he saved them all. He was a really funny guy. Antonin Kalina <clears throat> met, a Jew, met a Jew, Heinrich Flusser, when they were imprisoned in the Buchenwald concentration camp. Kalina, an outspoken Nazi resistor, had been a political prisoner from 1939. In 1944, he placed all the Jewish boys in one barrack and managed to save them all by telling the Nazis that they had typhus the Nazis were very afraid of disease, so they didn't go near his barracks. Heinrich Flusser, the Jew, was one, was one of the boys, and he told Kalina, he told us that Kalina was the only hero he ever touched. The Holocaust revealed new frontiers in human behavior, what we could not imagine as the worst, nor could we imagine as the best. All of us know that there is unjustified evil in the world. Rescuers taught us that there is also unjustified good. This is a picture of the front and back of the newest version of the Rescuers book. Um, these people raised many questions. Social scientists looked for patterns, but we made no assumptions. We found rescuers who had come from enormously wealthy homes and some who were very poor. Some were illiterate and some had doctorates. We found rescuers from religious families and from atheistic backgrounds. Some came from loving benign homes and some from orphanages. Some were bitter after the war, though very few. Most possessed a serenity and it was this serenity that we covered, coveted. What we learned from them was that one way to feel some peace in one's life is to serve others, to do whatever we can to alleviate the pain we see around us in our immediate families, our communities, or our larger world. These rescuers shared two common characteristics. They had extraordinary courage, a tolerance for a risk that may have been a gift. I accept that some people are braver than others, but the rescuers also possessed compassion and it's this compassion that we can all learn. These were people who did not avert their eyes from the problems around them. They noticed when a Jew disappeared from their home or when Jewish children began disappearing from school and more than noticed, they acted. They asked around and when they were called upon, they helped. We reveled in their diversity because it seemed that anyone could be a rescuer. There was no category that wasn't represented by these people. When we asked them, why did you do this? They almost resented the question. They said, how could I not? But we said, so few did. Are you kinder? Are you braver? They said, no, we're not heroes. We're ordinary. We just did what a human being ought to do. So this led, led to another question. What is it to be a human being? If we say that the rescuer is extraordinary, like Mother Teresa, we let ourselves off the hook. 
we don't have to expect this of ourselves. When we make the Nazi a demon and the rescuer a hero, we make them into people we do not have to identify with. We would never do what the Nazis did, but would we be a rescuer or would we be a bystander? There were only four parts to play during the war. You were either a perpetrator, a victim, a bystander, or a rescuer. Still today, really, these are the four roles from which we each must choose our part. We all have some of these parts inside us. The point is, often we can choose how to act, how to respond. During the war, to be a rescuer puts one life, one's life at risk. Today, we can make a commitment to serve others in many ways that are not so dangerous. We can commit helping our children understand about giving by giving to them and by letting them see us give of ourselves to others, teaching them that having a good heart is perhaps at least as important as making good grades and later earning lots of money. An interesting aside, is that many of these people who performed these radical acts of heroism did not go on to become financially successful. That just wasn't their priority in life. Even the hero, Oscar Schindler, who saved thousands of Jews, was never successful in his post-war ventures. Can we learn that we do have the time to commit to teaching an hour a week in a literacy program? or that we can pay our employees more? Can we do what Teddy Roosevelt asked of us? He said, do what you can with what you have, where you are. When these photographs were, were exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the wall text read, read, these portraits remind us that it is the individual who makes history and ultimately determines our definition of ourselves. When then I received a letter from the photography curator that said, I don't know if these pictures have made me a better person, but they've con convinced me that it's more possible to try. That's the point of this work, the lessons we can all hope to learn from these amazing people. Not only do the rescuers force the question, could I have done what they did? but their deeds lead to the ultimate question, what am I doing today? Because the example of the rescuer's deeds is still vital to our lives, a different publisher redesigned and published rescuers in this form in 2020. It has taken a long time to learn about rescuers. Why now? Perhaps our time demands that we know the best human beings can do and be. Rescuers inform us that kindness, compassion, and courage exist in all of us. History offers no promises, but the rescuers offer us hope, revealing that goodness is indeed part of the human spirit. I'd like to close with my, fam my favorite quote by the Irish poet Seamus Heaney. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then once in a lifetime, the tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Isn't that a great quote? Well, that's the end of my formal talk about- Thank you. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we already have some questions in the chat. Um, and this one, I think you know, it, it ties right into what you were just saying. So it, it seems uh, the timing is really, really good on this one. But it is actually from uh, Professor Loving's class. They're all they have joined us as a, a group. Um, and, and they are asking, saying, there's a warmth to your work as if you have formed a bond with the subject. Is it important to create a bond with your subject as, you know, as the photographer? And do you find yourself becoming emotionally attached with your subjects? 
Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> I have to say that it's important to me, I guess, in just thinking about that question, to form a connection with anyone I meet, with most people that I meet. Um, I, 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 I'm very interested and always feel that I can learn from other people. It's a very, it's, it's, it's a simple answer. I can't, I, that's just the way it is for me. Um, another uh, student from Professor Loving's class uh, is asking mm. if you think everyone should try photography as a method of understanding other people better. I do, of course, because that is the avenue that I have chosen and it has really worked for me. I just love meeting people and I love understanding people, whether they're similar to me or different from me. Um, it, it's, it very much enlivens and enriches my life. Um, I have, I know, uh, I have, uh, many students from my documentary photography class are here and we have the pleasure of speaking with you uh, next week. But, um, you know, we've been talking about the, the role of the photographer as storyteller. And, um, and I think the way you, you put it is, you know, so beautifully in, in your talk, but also in considering that sometimes the image alone doesn't tell the whole story. And, and that's why we've included the text, that's why you included text, uh, in the work and also why we wanted to make sure it was on display in the exhibition because it was such an integral part of the the story that you were telling. Um, but a, I've been telling a, little, a little aside about that mm -hmm. is that when the show, when the curator decided to show these at the Museum of Modern Art in New York mm -hmm. in 1992, <clears throat> she said, I don't think we want any text, we just want the pictures. And I said, okay. And uh, she called me not probably two weeks after that and said, no, I can see that we have to have text with the images. And so I made these text pieces, you know, to go with the images. Yeah, I mean, it, it does, it fills out the rest of the story and it gives it this, I mean, kind of air of authenticity, you know, especially with the other historical photos that you include, you know, again, to really round out the, the full narrative. Um, but I've been talking to my students about, you know, realizing that sometimes maybe you aren't the one that should tell that story. Maybe it's someone else should tell it because they have better access or maybe it's not your story to tell. Um, I was just wondering if there have been stories that you've maybe thought about telling but decided weren't your story to tell and, and maybe someone else would tell it better if there's a project maybe that you had in mind that you thought was a story and that someone else could tell better and or maybe one that you chose because you knew you could tell it well beyond rescuers which you did beautifully um well i i don't remember any um a desire to photograph anyone whose story i didn't want to know <laughs> that that's number one yeah uh, and uh, what was the other part of your question? Or just other stories that you just knew and you were known that you were really passionate about telling, like maybe bigger stories that you wanted to tell. Uh, um, there, there's no, no story that I've told, uh, in, in no people that I've photographed and interviewed as important as rescuers. But um, yes, I, in my later work, I definitely, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that I really made uh, so much of the text as I did with rescuers, but I definitely cared about their stories. Do we have um, any other questions? Um, you can put them in the chat. Uh, okay, we have one from Marilyn Wallagor, who's head of our program. Um, and she asked, did the awareness of the passage of time inform or give urgency to the rescuers project? Yes, definitely. Um, because uh, the, besides having been honored at Yad Vashem, I, I knew that rescuers were not known to the world. They just weren't known. And I, I thought that was, um, 
an injustice because we need those stories to give us courage to help others. I, I was wondering, was there um, anyone from rescuers that, well, I'm sure there were, but anyone that chose to uh, not be photographed or didn't want to participate? Any memorable? One, one, one woman who was a, a nun and had rescued people and would not be photographed because, you know, of the selflessness of a nun. Mm -hmm. One person, and I interviewed and uh, photographed uh, um, 105, mm -hmm. the number is, yes. Wow, that's pretty amazing that, and her reasons were still for selflessness, not yeah. even, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the new issue, the 2020 uh, issue of the book or where we can get um, it? Radius Books published it and they are a photography book publisher. They happen to be in Santa Fe. Um, and they, um, when the original rescuers uh, sold out of four, <clears throat> well, first of all, I should tell you that it, took 25 publishers told me no about rescuers until one, finally, a small uh, Jewish owned publisher in New York, Miriam Holmes, was the, the publisher was Holmes and Meyer, um, agreed to publish it. I mean, no one wanted to publish it. It was wild. And then it sold out of many, as I said, four printings. Well, it's and really beautiful. I mean, the the, the, the <laughs> new book radius really made a beautiful book out of it. It was not so much an art book because the publisher who who published it originally was not an art publisher. Mm -hmm. But but I think I, it really benefits. I had gone to many people to to find a publisher. Uh, 25 rejections on the book originally. Which is encouraging to everyone out there, all the students, that's <laughs> to be encouraged by that. Um, but, it, but it is, I think the treatment of it now makes so much sense as a photo book, as an art book with that cover, that cloth. I mean, I think that it, it really elevates it to, to what it could have been before, but certainly what it's become as, as you've continued to, to tell these stories. So it's- True, yes. Um, we have one last question from Jessica, uh, unless anyone else wants to hop in there, uh, but uh, we definitely have this one. And Jessica, our, our uh, curator, she asks, do you feel that your style or technique has changed throughout each of your portfolios? Did you approach photographing the rescuers differently than your previous subjects, um, other than including the text? I don't think so. I mean, I think it's something that is so far afield from rescuers, which was photographing uh, summer camp girls. And um, I, I, I photographed them at the summer camp I went to in the 50s. And my daughter was in her last of seven summers, as I might have said, um, <clears throat> when I went to visit and I decided to photograph girls then. Um, and then 25 years later, I asked Allison for help in finding them again. And so I have these diptychs and it, it, I was just really interested in where these young women had gone, you know, what had happened in their lives. It was a, it was a very different um, experience from photographing them at camp and photographing them 25 years later. Again, it's amazing that you got that amount of participation that you did with the adults that allowed you to, you know, create the diptychs that they, you could find them and that they were willing to let you photograph them again. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, um, most people um, like to be photographed, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and then it's, a, as um, someone said, it's a reasonable kind of attention to be paid. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, Diane Arbus said that. <laughs> well, she would know. Yeah, well, that's a funny way of looking at it, too. I mean, and I guess for the most part, 
it's true, especially obviously going back to thinking about the uh, relationship you had with your subjects and the bond, it's very clear that you have a rapport with your subjects. And we see the most intimate with your mother all the way to strangers that you interviewed. I mean, but you just walked into their homes as a stranger. And um, I and begin by asking them when and where they were born, what their parents were like and what the dinner table conversation was like when they were growing up. Hmm. And it sort of um, puts them into an internal place. It makes them think about their own life. I mean, I, it, this evolved naturally for me because I wanted to know the answer to those questions. But yeah. um, that, that I think that really helps people to get into themselves, to ask about their early life, you know, which they don't have to feel that I'm prying into what they're doing right now. And of course, that later came with the interview. Yeah, you're like, I'll, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pry in a minute. <laughs> I'm gonna get there in a second. Yeah. Well, it, it is, but you can see that bond in the photos. You can see that intimacy, and it's obviously to your credit that you could establish that same level of intimacy with strangers as you could with your own family or people that you had grown up around, um, because there, there is definitely a. Uh, a presence of trust there, which makes the the stories even more believable because we believe you as a narrator. We we trust you as a storyteller, which is again what makes so much of your work so uh, endearing, almost. Um, nice, thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I as someone who uses image and text and tries to tell stories, I, I appreciate uh, the way you do that on such a, a personal level and yet so so professional, but so kind. You know, but so uh, it's it is. It's just certainly something I look at as a as a model, and I and I'm sure students who are becoming familiar with your work uh, will feel the same way. Okay. Um, thank you so much for being here with us this evening as our honored photographer. Um, I, I like I said, for honoring me. Well, it was the pleasure was all ours, and and I know I can speak for Jessica as well. Um, we, uh, we will make this recording available. I'll send out a message and uh, let everyone know uh, that it's available. And um, also, if you haven't uh, had a chance to schedule an appointment to go see the exhibition over in SPIN, please do that. It'll certainly be worth it. Um, but Gay, thank you so, so much. And uh, Margaret and Bobby, thank you so much out there on, in the wings uh, helping us out. It's been a, a lovely, a lovely evening. And we look forward to keeping up with you and everyone needs to go grab a copy of Rescuers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Y'all have a, have a wonderful evening. You've got an extra hour of time uh, on us since y'all have got an hour, <laughs> an hour back. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye -bye. Stop sharing. You're doing on the wrong side. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs>